This is the current federal tax developments for the week of August the 26th, 2019. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Professional Education and your State Society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, and this week we're going to be talking about some developments that have taken place here in the area of federal taxes. We'll start out with a taxpayer who was arguing he was on the cash basis of accounting, and there was about a few million dollars of income in play here. So it was an interesting argument. The taxpayer doesn't win it, but it's still an interesting argument to look at. We have the OIRA finally has released the 451 regulations back to the IRS. So apparently we may have a new set of proposed regulations on a major Tax Cuts and Jobs Act topic coming out. That's the area dealing with the revenue conformity and advanced payment rules that were changed by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. We have a case of a taxpayer who yet again lost on arguing they were a real estate professional for purposes of the passive activity loss rules. We'll talk about how this taxpayer's records turned out to be faulty and cost them the deduction. And we'll talk about maybe what your client should be doing to make this work. And finally, the IRS did formally decide to issue the memo that formally changes its position on two French taxes. We had talked about these taxes before. The change has been posted on the website. We now have some formal guidance, or at least quasi-formal guidance, an LB&I memo that tells us how the IRS now says they're going to handle this situation and what they've told agents to do about the situation. Well, finished up my pre, shall we say, final deadline courses. So I'm not going to be doing anything for a little while here uh, in terms of on the road doing courses because you guys aren't probably coming out to see anything in the interim because we're going to be within two weeks of a deadline here. We come back next week every time being two weeks of a deadline. So I've got stuff to do. You've got stuff to do. We'll take care of that then. Uh, do remember there will be courses coming up after October 15th. And we still have a little bit of time if you want to for your firm have somebody come by and actually do a full session for the firm. You can check with your state societies. We can be booked uh, to come in and do those courses. I've got a few days left. It gets a little tight this time of year, but a few days left uh, in the, I think, a very, very tight in November. But I have a few days left in the or late October time frame and a few days left and some days left in December or January. Uh, obviously, you know, you could do the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, but hey, probably nobody wants that day. So, you know, we'll, we'll take what we can. But if you're interested in that, contact your State Society of CPAs. You can contact us. We'll get you in touch with who you need to get in touch in order to do that. Generally, the rough rule is you have to have enough people in the room to have it make sense to have a dedicated instructor. So probably 15 to 20 would be a good starting point and a topic you want them to cover because we can cover any of the topics that, you know, we're able to cover in a full day course. We can do them there as well. Let's go ahead and take a look at our actual developments this week, though. And let's start up with the case of King Solarman, Inc. versus Commissioner. Tax Court Memorandum Decision 2019-103. The case was issued, came down, the opinion came down on August the 19th. This particular taxpayer is a manufacturer of various solar equipment. And he got a pretty big order you know, for solar equipment. In fact, at the end of the day, this particular taxpayer was looking at an order of just under $8 million, and he had about $5.8 million of that on a note. Now, the taxpayer was arguing, based on the fact, you know, that particular sale, he was saying, you know what, I'm really on the cash basis of accounting. And being on the cash basis of accounting, I don't need to recognize that $5.8 million worth of revenue, even though I'm recognizing the entire cost of sale. Because by the end of the year, he had delivered all 162 units, but he had not actually, you know, he'd only been paid a partial payment. He had a note for the rest. So he was trying to argue that cash basis of accounting, he'd be able to deduct the expenses he incurred this year, but he would be able to then claim the income in the later year when he actually collected it. Well, there were a couple of issues involved in this case, in fact, a number of them. One problem is the taxpayer argued he had been using the cash basis of accounting. Because as you may understand, the taxpayer is able to use any general basis of accounting that's allowed by the code as long as it clearly reflects income and there's no code provision that prevents him from using it. Well, the taxpayer, of course, claims now, well, I've been cash basis. The problem is under 451E, if you want to change that method, you have to get the IRS's permission. Now, quite often we can change for certain changes, like going from cash to accrual, uh, fixing depreciation errors, 
doing any of those automatic changes that we may have under the small taxpayer accounting method rules that we got with TCJ. You can just file a 3115 with the return, but you still have to do that. You need the IRS's permission. If you don't have their permission, you can't change your method. That's also true if your method is not even allowed by the code. Regardless, whatever method you're using, you have to get the IRS permission to change it. Now, when the agent comes in, the agent, if the agent concludes that you weren't allowed to use a method, or the agent concludes that your method does not properly, you know, misstates income, and the IRS can carry that wherever you take it to appeals, to the courts, whatever, they can force a change on the exam. The agent can. But the catch with this was the taxpayer is claiming he's always been on the cash basis of accounting. Now, he's never filed a 3115 to change that method. So the problem is, if he's been on accrual in prior years, regardless of whether he could be cash basis or not, I know a few of you are probably screaming, he can't be cash basis. Don't worry about that. We'll get to it in just a second. But basically, he even if he can be cash basis, he can't be cash basis unless he has the permission. If he has always been accrual. Now, the taxpayer has a couple of problems with this. All of his tax returns for every year, including the year in which the sale took place for the company, have all marked the box. You know, there's a box there that's for your general basis of accounting, cash accrual other. Every year they had marked the box as accrual. Well, okay, that's a little problem. Uh, and honestly, it may not be a total problem. If, in fact, he had always been truly recording everything on the cash basis, then checking the box doesn't really change anything because I already said, if you do something not allowed by the code, it's still your method. And the IRS is only going to be able to change that method. You know, if they're only going to be able to change it, essentially, they're going to have to show it misstates income or it's one of those absolutes you can't be on this method rules. So, you know, if he was truly using the cash basis, the fact he checked that box wouldn't really be the key. The IRS would have to look elsewhere to get him on the accrual basis. But the court didn't buy that theory that he had actually been doing cash basis. The court, he said, well, first it was a mistake to check the box for accrual on the return. Now, of course, this mistake had been carried over for about five years. It had always been done that way. And the court pointed out that every year he had his return done by a CPA. Now, if it was truly a mistake that they hadn't meant to be accrual, he said most likely the CPA would have concluded that probably they should have filed, filed a 3115 and got a change of method just in case. At the very least, they should have changed the box. Something should have happened. Well, none of that happened. The box kept being checked accrual basis. And then the taxpayer said, well, regardless, we've been, we've been keeping our books on the tax cash basis and we've been reporting on the tax return that way. The court had a little problem there, too. Turns out, inside of his records, he had a number of references to things like uh, accrued salaries, accounts payable, payroll taxes payable, you know, income taxes payable, credit card payables. He had all of these payables on his books. All of those payables suggested that he was on the cash basis. He was on the accrual basis of accounting because those payables wouldn't exist on the cash basis. You can't accrue that stuff. Right? That's the whole point. Accrual? Accruing? Yeah, we can't do that. Now, the court admitted that he hadn't actually been filling out the forms correctly. His 1125A that showed cost of sales for his manufacturing operation didn't have beginning inventory or ending inventory and didn't have any labor, even though clearly they were building this stuff. But he said even though there were real problems how the return had been done, there was no clear evidence that the return had been done on the cash basis, that the return had actually been done only on cash basis activity. He presented no evidence to back that up. His ledger title suggested it wasn't, and he never had the CPA testify who prepared the returns. So the court said, everything we can see right now suggests you were accrual. Nothing we see says you were cash, and you've not presented any evidence, so I'm just going to say you're accrual basis. But hey, don't, don't worry too much, because effectively, even though we agree you've already elected it, even if you hadn't elected, he would have been required to be on the accrual basis anyway. The court went in and carried on a discussion here looking at the rules under Reg 1.446-1C2I. And it tells you that, and that's a regulation, 446 is your method of accounting rules. It tells you if you have to maintain inventory, you must report on the accrual basis of accounting. 
Section 471 and the regulations under that, under Section Regulation 1.471-1, tells us that if your production, purchase, or sale of merchandise are a significant income producing factor, you have to keep inventories. If you have to keep inventories, then you've got to be accrual basis. He's manufacturing this large of equipment that is meant for solar power. He, and he know everybody got the, he, he built 162 of these standard units. He's manufacturing them. He's selling them out of inventory. Uh, the court said effectively, you know, the sale, you know, income, the income producing factor, the only one you've got is the production and sale of that merchandise. So by bottom line, you have to keep inventories. Taxpayer said, well, wait, 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 I, I didn't keep inventories. And the court said, okay, I agree you didn't. The question is whether you didn't. The question is whether you had to. And he said, and second, I had nothing on hand at the beginning or end of the year, so I have no inventory. And the court pointed out that's not the issue. The issue is, are you selling merchandise capable of being inventoried? And if you are selling merchandise capable of being inventoried, you have to use inventories. We don't care how much or how little you have at the end of the year. You could have none. You know, you could basically, as soon as something is made, it's out the door and gone. That doesn't matter. You would be required to keep inventories if anything had been left over. And because of that, the test here is more, is merchandise significant? If merchandise is significant, that triggers the 471 inventory rules, and that triggers a cruel basis. So the bottom line is, if you are selling merchandise, generally you've got to be on the accrual basis. Now they tried for another issue here. They tried to argue that, well, we should qualify for the small business safe harbor, which at the time was Revenue Procedure 2228. The tax court in that area said, well, you, you're actually not a qualified business. If you may remember, if your revenues were in excess of $1 million per year, but less than 10 million per year and this business apparently they only had you know they'd have one or two big sales and this was like the sale for the year so they were below 10 million but you had to be in a proper category this was not a proper category of business this type of manufacturer couldn't qualify for 2228 relief so the court said tough luck guys you're not as qualified small business that's important because now since the tax cuts and jobs act we have had changes and basically to the law under 448C, under 471, under 263 Cap A, that allows businesses of less than 25 million to ignore the unit cap rules of 263 Cap A, to keep inventories by treating them as supplies or using whatever they're using for their books, inventory method under 471, 471 rules, and then, you know, and I should say ignore the basic 471 rules, and finally use the cash basis of accounting. So it is possible today that this taxpayer would qualify for that, but he'd have the same problem if he hadn't filed for a change of method. You need to file a Form 3115, even if you meet the small business accounting standard. The 3115 is still required to switch you over to the cash basis. If you're not currently on the cash basis, to switch you out of unit cap if you're currently on unit cap, and to get you off of standard inventory rules and on to either treating them as supplies or treating them under whatever method you're using on your books, even if it doesn't comply with 471. So all of those require a 3115. So in his case, because he hadn't really paid attention to much of that anyway, I think we still could have very well had a problem with that. 3115 wouldn't have been filed. But remember, somebody in this case today, if you got there in time, you do a 3115, and you might very well get the result he got here. It's kind of interesting how it would work, but you know, we'll see how the service works on this. This is another one of those areas we don't have regs yet on. So we don't actually know, you know, we have some guidance and a you know a rev proc on how to ask for the change of method, but we don't have any regs that explain to us some of the details here. We had a little, you know, the IRS did tell us on the 471 opt out that, you know, your opt out there, they they reserve the right to challenge it if it misstated income. We have to wonder if they'll reserve the right in other cases. And like you have to consider, what about a case like this? Would the IRS reserve the right to challenge where he's recording all of his expenses on this you know, sale that was nearly $8 million, but he's only recording a small amount of the revenue? Would that be considered to the IRS misstating income? And would that be a further limitation? Stay tuned because we do not have regs yet and we're missing those regs. Well, but hey, good news. We may not be missing one a set of regs here shortly. 
Tax analyst Nathan Richmond of Tax Analyst reported this week in an article entitled Tax Accounting Proposed Rates Could Be on the Horizon that was published in Tax Notes Today Federal on August 22nd that the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs of the Office of Management and Budget has finally completed their review of the proposed regulations under Section 451. The IRS had sent through two sets of proposed regulations under 451. The first one would deal with the revenue conformity rules added in 451B that relate to, you know, basically if you have an Apple financial statement, you have to report your revenue at least as quickly for tax purposes as you do for as you do on your AFR, your Apple financial statement. And secondly, we've got a set of rules here that relate to the 451C rules that codified the advanced payment rules found previously in IRS Revenue Procedure 2004-34. We've now codified those what used to be elective advance payment rules and they now become the only advance payment rules that can be used. So we're waiting for regs on that as well. Now I realize you've already had to file the returns. You're going to be filing the returns here shortly. And even if we get them on Monday morning first thing, because we didn't have them Friday afternoon, so the earliest it seems like they could pop out would be Monday morning. But even if we got them right then, that still leaves very little time to adjust for your September 15th due dates. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see how the IRS deals with that and what we'll be doing and how they'll interpret these, these two rules. But OIRA did complete the review of these. These proposed regs have been with OIRA for a long time. One thing you've got to notice right now, I have not been talking about proposed regs. I've been talking about, you know, the last long set of reg thing I talked to you about was back in January when we got the final regulations that dealt with the issues of the 199 Cap A. We then discussed final regulations on state and local tax credits. But essentially, aside from those things, we haven't had discussions about things we already thought we would have by now, like final regulations on bonus depreciation that they were talking initially about having out before the end of last year, final regulations on the 163J interest rules. Well, we've got lots of these things. We've got many things tied up at OIRA or not even moved to OIRA yet. So the pace of issuing regulations has slowed down dramatically. And this will be the first major set we've had pretty much since the rules came out on co agricultural cooperatives. And while I understand that's a really big deal if you're in the agricultural industry, obviously it's not a big deal if you're not in that industry. And so this will be the first set of broad-based regulations we've seen in quite a while that will be released, but they are coming out. So keep your eyes on them. We just don't know, you know, what they'll do. Treasury did indicate, even though these regulations went in as two sets to OIRA, one dealing with advanced payment, the second dealing with revenue conformity. They plan to issue them as a single set of regs. When are they appearing? This is a little more open for timing. When we had the final regulations under 199 Cap A, they actually brought those out within a what was ba the following day after OIRA released them. That obviously didn't happen this time. We've gone a few days since release and nothing's happened. I would be hopeful we'll see these regs by the end of next week, you know, by the end of this week, I should say. And so that before we get into September, we'll at least have the regs to look at for a second. Uh, but, you know, Treasury is, doesn't necessarily have to issue them that quickly. In theory, Treasury could just decide not to go with these and resubmit another set. We're hoping they're not doing that, but you never know. So in any event, though, I think it's very likely in the within this week, we will be seeing these regulations for revenue conformity. So if your client has an AFR, that's going to be very important. Also, advanced payments. If you have a client who receives advanced payments and is accrual basis, you're going to want to look at you know how those rules go. It looks like 2000. Looks like the old Red Proc 2004-34 is just pretty much being picked up and dropped in the code. And if you've been using that old Red Proc, I suspect we won't see major changes in what you'll be doing. But you will want to review that. And if you've not been using that Red Proc, then yeah, things could be very different for your client than they'd been before. Next up, we'll have a court case. This time, we're going to take a look at the case of Hairston versus Commissioner, Tax Court Memorandum Decision 2019-104-82019. And this one, when I 
put out the Twitter announcement about this, I kind of said the theme song for this, it's been the theme song for a lot of clients who are trying to be real estate pros, end up in the tax court, is another one bites the dust by queen. Because this is another taxpayer who is going to fail in front of the tax court to prove that they're a real estate professional. Now, let's remember the rules for being a real estate pro, okay? A little bit of review here, so you remember how this works. By default, under 469C2, any rental is a passive activity. As we all remember, generally you cannot deduct losses on passive activities except the extent of income. While there is the active rental real estate exception that gets you up to 25,000 of losses, that goes away at 150,000 of AGI. And I will point out that that 150,000 of AGI rule, 100 to 150,000 phase out range, has never been adjusted for inflation. It went in in 1986. So obviously it's covering fewer and fewer taxpayers every year can fall within a 100 to 150 range to get it. So these days, especially for those taxpayers who come to see CPAs, for the most part, we're just not seeing those people. You know, they're not coming in. They're not actually, you know, those people aren't the ones we normally see. So the catch is most of our clients, if they have a rental activity, they're just piling up the losses if it has losses year to year unless they can qualify as a real estate pro. Under 469C7B, you know, th this came in later because the real estate industry was screaming that this was unfair. They were, you know, they were in the industry. They were just as much a real trader business as anybody else. This wasn't just an investment thing. So Congress said, well, if you're really in real estate, and you can qualify as a real estate pro, then we are going to get rid of this automatic passive. You still have to show you majority participate in your rentals, but we're going to get rid of the fact that you, you can't even be allowed to show that. So you're, but to be a real estate pro, you have to meet two criteria found in 469C7. First thing in, more than half of your professional personal services must be performed in trades or businesses that are real estate related. And there's a whole list of those found in C7. And then secondly, you have to have at least 70 hours during a taxable year in those real property trades or businesses. This particular case, oh, and I should add one more thing. If you're a married couple, well, for the most part of 469, we can combine the hours of each to determine if we materially participate. To be a real estate pro, we don't care what your spouse does. One or the other spouse has to, at least one or the other, has to be able to be a real estate pro using only their time. So here's the interesting catch. Mrs. Hairston uh, actually worked for the Department of Homeland Security. Okay, she's going to be tough to qualify because she's got 2,000 hours in something else. And Department of Homeland Security is not really a real estate trader business. I'm sure she doesn't own more than 5% of it. So basically, those hours aren't going to count. So we come back and we take a look at, you know, she'd be very difficult to meet the first test. But Mr. Hairston had retired. So he's going to be easier because presumably, you know, being retired at this point, he doesn't have any other trade or business, any other activity he's involved in. So all of his hours will be in real estate. So he'll be able to meet the first test easy. His problem is, does he have 750 hours? And that's where we began to get in trouble. The IRS had agreed already, you know, that they had the real estate, they materially participated in it. They had the losses. We weren't fighting over any of that. We were fighting over where they're real estate pro. If they were a real estate pro, they were going to get the losses in this case. If they weren't a real estate pro, they were going to lose the losses. And the losses in question in this case added up to, as I recall, somewhere just under $55,000 for the three years that were before the tax court. So we're talking about taxes on 55 grand, not, not a minor amount of money, enough to fight over, I assume we could say. So here's what happened. We have two rentals, and they said they're a real estate pro based on that. Now, Mrs. Hairston kept the books, and Mr. Hairston uh, went out. He did lawn work. He did some repairs, minor repairs. He collected the rent. He got tenants. He did that sort of thing. Obviously, we want to qualify Mr. Hairston because Mrs. Hairston is in big trouble with her full-time job. It's going to be very difficult to get her over the top. So we're looking at qualifying Mr. Hairston. Now, they had the two ca a calendar for each rental. Those two calendars had 360 events and a total of 932 hours. The tax court remarked that the handwriting on there was the same, so one person only was keeping track of the hours. Didn't say who that was, but it appeared to the court to be clear only one was doing anything on the calendar. And why would they mention that? 
Well, because there's two of them here, and if only one of them is writing down the hours, that suggests that at the very best, somebody's coming in and kind of out of memory telling them how many hours to put in. And you'll discover the court doesn't necessarily buy that this thing is accurate. So it had these hours. Now, the hours they had down, it but didn't have who did something. They, they had how long it took to do it, what they were doing, but did not have who. So they went and they worked it up and using whatever they could, they tried to come between the IRS and the taxpayer to some sort of agreement about the hours. And at the end of the day, when they got to court, the IRS had agreed that of the hours that they had, 669 hours, which was most of the hours, related to Mr. Hairston. There were 90 some hours that it wasn't clear who did it. The tax court pointed out if we assumed that all of those hours we can't figure out went to Mr. Hairston, then the IRS total would be 762 hours. The taxpayers who were looking at it a little differently claimed that no, 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 the proper way to add up that calendar had Mr. Hairston with 781 hours. The catch is, regardless of which one of those numbers you take, obviously a 669 is right, he didn't meet 750. But let's assume, let, let's just assume that all those unknown hours break to Mr. Hairston. If all those unknown hours break to Mr. Hairston, he's still not way over the top. He's only 12 hours over. And even if we take the taxpayer's claim, he's 31 hours over. So if he has been, if they've been inflating time on the calendar, then he's probably not going to make the 750. Remember, he automatically pretty much qualifies the first test. The only thing he's doing are real estate activities, and it's all of his hours, 100%. So he'll meet test one, test two, 750 hours is his problem in this case. Now, what the court found was they, they took a look at this particular calendar, and they said, we have some problems with the calendar. First, the court noted every task on the calendar, no matter how trivial it was, was claimed to take an hour. And the court pointed out that there were 36 one-hour activities that consisted of receiving a check payment, issuing a receipt for check for a rent payment, or depositing the rent payment in the bank. Now, I realize sometimes you hit a line at the bank, but in most cases, it's far less than an hour to deposit a check. It's far less than an hour to get the rent payment, to pick up the payment from the, from the client. You know, they hand you the check, you're there. And it's also probably far less than an hour to write up the receipt for the rent payment. But every one of those activities they put down is for an hour. There were 13 entries that claimed it took one hour to pay the mortgage. I mean, I, maybe wants very careful handwriting on the mortgage check. I don't know. But it took him an hour to pay the mortgage every month. And 11 hours, and, and there were 11 and one hour attached during the year to remind the tenants to pay their rent. Uh, the court didn't believe any of those. You know, they, they said, they said, you did those things, no question, but none of them should have taken near an hour. You know, we're not going to be an idiot and assume that they always took, you know, there might be one or two cases where there was a line at the bank or something, and that one took an hour plus. But they're saying just in general, it's going to take an hour. Eh, we don't buy that story. Also, they had between 93 and 105 hours that were related to snow removal in their schedule for year 2014. The court noted None of the leases said they were responsible for clearing snow on the property. That's a bit unusual for a landlord to be required to clear snow on the property. You know, I mean, if you're running an apartment complex, yeah, because of liabilities and common area type stuff. We're talking about like sing two single family homes. Would the taxpayer, ha you know, would the tent landlord come out and clear the snow normally? I'm sure if you're a tenant, you'd love for that to happen. Just come and clear my driveway. But no, generally doesn't and there didn't happen here and they noticed something too at trial they actually decided what what happened was the snow removal all related to a garage on the, on the because the two properties were next to each other and there was a garage there neither tenant was allowed to use that garage and it took time to clean off the driveway to that six car garage and it turned out that actually the only people that used that garage were the taxpayers and they had cars in there and tools so the court held that those hours had nothing to do with rental. They were personal hours, just, you know, cleaning off the driveway to your storage unit. And it doesn't matter if your storage, your storage unit, the fact it was near your rental properties doesn't make those rental hours. Finally, we had additional hours that Mr. Harris, Harrison reportedly uh, was going to be watching and supervising contractors doing work. According to his records, he spent 33 hours watching carpet being installed. 
and cleaned and 40 hours supervising contractors painting the inside of the rental. You could tell the court was getting a little skeptical of everything because they said while they realized Mr. Harrison is retired and probably has lots of time on his hand, they didn't find it plausible that he spent an entire week doing nothing but watching paint dry. You know, they're saying that that's obviously inflated. They secondly said, even if we accepted that, he's not doing any painting. Nobody alleged he painted. Nobody alleged he cleans carpets. Nobody alleged he installed carpets. So at best, he was there since he wasn't doing anything. He was there to be on call to answer questions in case an issue arose. The court said being on call is not activity. You know, that was it. The, you know, the whole thing, you were there. There was no reason to be there. It was busy work. Uh, we're not going to count those hours. So the court decided, having looked at all of this, that they decided that essentially they believed his hours for that year had been inflated by at least 150 hours. And if you take 150 hours off even the taxpayers, 781 hours, we suddenly discover that we're nowhere near 750. And because of that, he failed as a real estate professional. Now, the takeaway from this that's important for our clients is our clients have to understand that you need to pass the smell test and have detailed records. We're not required to go examine those records and know what they are in detail. But, to, but you need to be aware that you could have very real liability if you don't, at the very least, tell the client and document in writing you've told the client about the types of situations, cases like this, where that's not going to be adequate. You need to have better records. You can't just have rough estimates later. You can't make everything an hour at a minimum because that's not the real world. That doesn't happen. You should have realistic time frames, real times, things that make sense, and not put things in there that clearly are stretching it. Anything that makes your records look unreliable is going to cause you to lose this case in tax court. So they need to be very aware of that. Taxpayers are getting killed on this case after case after case. We really need to be careful that clients understand that Real Estate Pro is something the IRS is attacking. And they're attacking it because they have such an easy time winning the cases. They're not crazy. They go after things that are easier to win. Finally, I'll mention here at the end of this week's session, the IRS has issued a formal memo that actually deals with something we talked about a couple weeks ago. This is LBNI 04081907. It covers both LBNI and small business self-employed. It's a directive out to agents of both divisions telling them what to do about certain French taxes. This formalized guidance that went on their website on July 21st. So we had this guide to French taxes, which I will again will not attempt to pronounce. You want to check what they are. I'll give you their, I'll give you basically the acronyms, the CSG and the CRDS. The actual names of the taxes, I actually didn't go to Google Translate and got the pronunciation. And as soon as I got it, it's like, well, I'm not going to be able to say that. And I didn't want to just capture it here or try to mic record it. So we're just going to go with you. Go to the website. You'll get the full name if you're interested of it. Probably if you know, if you're at the French taxes, that the IRS had previously taken the position and represented Social Security type taxes, you'll know what the CSG and the CRDS are. And they do still represent a potential refund opportunity if you did not claim the credit in the prior years. Now, the, the memo notes that the IRS had lost a case in the D.C. Court of Appeals in 2014 after winning a tax court and saying that these taxes were not creditable for foreign tax credit purposes. In the interim, we've also had the State Department now notified the IRS in, in May that they now have a joint directive with France where they've agreed that these did not, these don't meet the criteria for under the agreement the U.S. had with France regarding Social Security style taxes to be an additional Social Security style tax. So the IRS has now announced that they are going to stop challenging any claim that these taxes are eligible for the foreign tax credit. So if you have a client who has paid these taxes and has not claimed the foreign tax credit on them because you didn't think they were credible taxes, you might want to go back and look at refund opportunities there. Again, this is specifically related to that case, specifically related to the French taxes, and essentially specifically related to the fact the IRS had lost on this issue in court. So that's a big reason for what's happening. Again, we're heading to this time of year where I know you're probably not thinking of signing up for a bunch of CPE courses when you got all these due dates in front of you. You know, it is, I just want to get these things out the door. 
Um, but nevertheless, consider, don't forget, there will be CPE after October 15th. You might want to take a chan chance now and take a look at what's coming up. Plan your end of year CPE. Your state societies have live CPE coming out throughout the end of the year. I'll be going to a number of states to present. I'll be doing a couple of conferences. As I said, I think last week in Minnesota. And I'll be doing a conference uh, in Washington that will relate to these issues, relate to various issues. I'll be doing courses around the country. I'll be in Michigan. I will be in Idaho. I'll be in New Mexico. I have a few others. I'll be in New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey, I'll be doing a t the advanced tax update course. So that'll be one we talk about what's happened this year uh, aimed at individuals who are comfortable talking, you know, on a little more advanced level, shall we say. Uh, but we'll talk about kind of those things. Still be the type of updates we get here. But you know, kind of aim for people who have a bit more experience is what we're doing. So if you're in that realm, you're one of us older guys, uh, that, that'll be the type of updates you might enjoy as opposed to traditional updates, which spend a lot of time reviewing things that, yeah, you know, no, no, I don't need a review of that. I need to know what changed. That's more of how we'll do it. So take a look at your take a look at your society guides and see what see what's coming up and consider registering for our courses. To register for the courses I'll be doing. The courses I'll be doing, if you go to the currentfieldtaxdevelopments.com website, I actually have those under the events tab. Uh, you can find essentially the courses that I have coming up and links to the registrations. A few of those courses will also be available as as webcast, live webcast. And we may have some things coming up that will also be available as replay webcast. Uh, we're still working on that. I'll let you know if I know when anything's available then. So we'll be doing those sorts of backgrounds too. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments, updated for the week of August 26, 2019. Current Federal Tax Developments, you can follow us online on our website, currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. We will post our stories there during the week. I'll be here in Phoenix this week, so hopefully I won't get delayed as much in getting stories together. This time it was kind of late in the week when I got all the stories finally finalized and written up. We have that there. You can send me an email for any questions, edzollers at currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. You can also follow me on Twitter. My handle there is at edzollers. I also follow online on the Reddit subgroup of slash r slash tax pros. So if you want to post some questions or issues there, I try to look on there on, looking on there from time to time. If you're a CPA or attorney, you can also join the tax talk group from Cal CPA, Yahoo groups. It'll be groups.yahoo.com. Look for the website. Look for the group called Tax Talk. You can apply to get in. You should be let in and you can discuss things there. I also look in on three different state societies connect groups. That is my home state here of Arizona. I also look in on Minnesota and New Jersey. So if you have issues there, you post there. I'll try to get back. If I see something I think I can help with, I'll try to post there on issues as they come up. Otherwise, another week coming, we might have proposed regs next week on that revenue conformity issue. So if that's a big one, it'll be a big one if you, you do audited financial statements. You have any audits, your firm does audited statements because that's going to clearly be one or you have clients who file with state or municipal governments. For instance, here in Arizona, if you've got a water company, you're filing a financial statement with the Arizona Corporation Commission. That's going to qualify. That would qualify as a, if the IRS in reg says it qualifies, it would qualify for one. We still don't know if they'll be in that group or not. That could be a big issue. Uh, if you file it with the feds, we know that will be in an AFR statement. So we got, I should say, Apple for AFS, not AFR, AFS statement. So we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep an eye on any other developments that come this week. Anything else comes up. And I'm sure we'll have lots of things to talk about, I'm sure, over the next few weeks because we'll have so much little time to actually pay attention to them. So that's when they always come out. So come back here next week and we'll talk to you about current federal tax developments.